So this topic is, I think, super important because it seems to be really taboo, and that is intimacy issues. Now, there are many factors, actually, when you, when you want to talk about intimacy um, after ostomy surgery. There's a lot of mental, emotional, but there's also physical factors that you have to consider as well. I think the most important thing that you can do, obviously, is to communicate with your partner. Let them understand what you're feeling. Try to understand maybe what they're feeling. Sometimes just talking it out, you'll, you'll, you'll understand what the other person, what their, um, what their problem might be. Maybe they're apprehensive. Maybe they don't want to engage with any, with any intimacy. And there might be a very specific reason for that. I know one, uh, actually a good friend of mine, she said that her husband was deathly afraid of hurting her after surgery. So she actually went into an appointment with her surgeon, brought her husband along, and the surgeon had said, no, I mean, you're not going to hurt her. She's not going to break. She's not made of glass. And that kind of prompted things to get a lot better in this department for her. So, you know, sometimes just communicating. What are your concerns? Are you worried about maybe leaks? Well, communicate with your partner. Like, this isn't, you know, maybe unlikely to happen, or this is something that I've done to reduce the chance. You have to have that communication there. If, if everyone's kind of going in without knowing what the other partner's feeling, it becomes a lot harder to move forward with that. Another thing that I think is really important, especially for men or anyone really who's had surgeries that involve the rectum, the anal region, uh, is to talk about any of the risks and possible solutions with your surgeon. There may be complications that come out, unfortunately, through the surgery that may impact your ability to function sexually. That has to be discussed with your doctor. There are options to help with that. There are risks that you should know about and I think it's really important that you talk to your doctor um, before and after the surgery because your, your surgeon should be following up with you and asking you the question. If they don't, let them know what's going on. You know, is everything okay? Is there pain anywhere? Let them know. Um, look for products and accessories that might help you to feel more comfortable. And this is something, this is a really cool area. This happens to be like a niche market that has sprung up and I've noticed a lot of companies coming out with products like this. But there are certain undergarments and accessories that are used mostly for intimacy. Uh, they may be used to support an appliance, to make someone feel more sexy, um, to, to just, you know, bolster confidence in people. So there are a lot of products out there that can help you. Now, depending on what your need is, right? If your need is, well, I just don't want the bag flinging around. Okay, well, there's a product for that. Uh, but explore those products. I think that, that can really help you, uh, especially if you're self-conscious. You know, maybe you don't want your partner to see it. And I can understand that. But there are things you can do to help cover things up, to help keep things concealed, to help keep things secure, okay? Another thing that I think is really important is to really build up your own self-esteem and confidence. Confidence to me really only comes with experience and planning. So at first it's going to feel really awkward even just to talk about it. Once you become more confident in yourself, your ability to handle you know, the management of your appliance perhaps, then things should be a little easier for you. What I notice is that partners tend to mirror how you're behaving. If you're the type of person who um, might be ashamed or, or, or project that you're ashamed, your partner only reads that. And unfortunately, it may mirror itself back onto you. But if you build up on your confidence, you know, if you show your partner that, hey, you know what, I feel sexy, I want to do things with you, then that'll get your partner thinking, okay, well, all right, if you're in for it, I'm in for it, right? Let's, let's go. So you, you have to really understand that I think a lot of the times your partner is going to reflect what you're feeling. So try to work on building up that self-esteem and confidence. I think that's so important. Now there's more to intimacy than sex, obviously. Um, there are a lot of couples that will tell you this. You know, a lot of the times intimacy and, you know, this big cliche intimacy starts outside of the bedroom. And it's so true, you know communicating with your partner, building that trust with them, finding other ways to satisfy them, finding other ways that might satisfy you in the same, uh, in the same way to fill your needs. I think those are really important. You know, if, if actual intercourse is difficult, there are other ways. 
But again, this might be something you want to talk to both your partner and your surgeon about and see what options are available. So there are some practical tips um, before you get into engaging in any kind of sexual um, activities. And there are actually a lot of tips that I can share on this. I, I, I actually made a like 40 odd minute video specifically dealing with sex and intimacy. Uh, and I do actually have a couple of female friends on there who share their experience too. So that might be something to check out. But obviously you want to make sure that you're prepared. So that might mean maybe emptying your appliance. That might mean changing your appliance, you know, having a shower, you know, feeling fresh. These are all just very simple things that you can do to help increase your confidence, maybe increase your self-esteem, but also just assure uh, you and your partner that, you know, you're prepared, you're ready to go, you know, let's do this. An ostomy support garment, you'll notice in the, in the bottom picture there, um, I actually have my appliance folded up. So it's not sideways in there, it's actually just folded up. And um, that's a, an ostomy wrap. So that's very similar to the beige product in the other slide. It's just folded up so that it's a lot smaller. Uh, they actually have other products that are just designed to be that size that you can find. Um, and those work really well. For, for ladies out there, you might be used to like belly bands, like for maternity. Those will work too. Uh, I've actually used them myself. The only difference though with belly bands and an actual ostomy wrap is that the ostomy wrap will have a pocket in there to help support your appliance. What I find personally is if I were to wear just a regular band, sometimes the bottom of the appliance dangles down and I don't want that. So with uh, an ostomy wrap, it actually keeps it all contained and it doesn't, you can't see it at all. So tips for caregivers, I think this is important. It's not often talked about. I get a lot of people saying, where's the information for caregivers? I, I don't see it. My hospital doesn't provide it. Um, I don't find the information anywhere. Why don't you talk more about what caregivers can do? And I think this is important. And this can apply to somebody who might be actually managing an appliance for a loved one, but also maybe someone who's involved with a loved one who has an ostomy, and maybe they just want to help to better understand that situation. So the first thing I think that's important with healthcare providers, and this goes for nurses, GPs, surgeons, gastroenterologists, the whole gamut, is to reassure your patient, okay, but don't make false promises. I think this is huge, and it's mostly the responsibility, I think, of the surgeon when someone goes in for surgery, not to say this will be a cure for your illness or set them up where they might think, you know, reversal is guaranteed, no problem, in a couple months you can have a reversal. I think that's, that's not a good thing. I think it sets up the patient to have a false hope sometimes. Sometimes a reversal isn't possible. Uh, you don't want to tell someone you can have a reversal, no problem, you'll be cured and then it ends up maybe that they have to have their ostomy longer than that or it's permanent. So, you know, be realistic with your patient. You'll understand their needs, I think, better than really anyone, including them sometimes, uh, but don't make false promises. The second point, I think, would be don't assume that your patient believes that their ostomy is like some kind of tragedy. And this actually happened to me when I was receiving home care. And I didn't actually have a stoma nurse at the time. There was a stoma nurse that I could call, but I had home care. Uh, I had a home care nurse um, basically to tend to some of the wounds after surgery that I had. But I remember one time, you know, when 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 a, a nurse came in and she kind of said, "Wow, you're really young. I'm so sorry that you have this surgery and that you have an ostomy now." And I thought, that's a weird thing to say, because I'm like super happy that I have this thing. Like, it's just like really, I'm really grateful to have this. And for me, it was kind of like, you know, I, I kind of cast that aside, okay. But, but then I thought, someone who may not be uh, in the right mind space or as positive at that moment, they might really find that hurtful to say something like that. Because maybe, you know what, yeah, maybe it is a tragedy at that time for them. And they might feel worse. So just don't, don't make the assumption. You know, if you want to feel sorry for them, feel sorry for the fact that maybe they got sick and their illness was terrible. Um, you know, I, I curse Crohn's disease a hundred times over, but I do not curse my ostomy. You know, it's a blessing. Um, so that's an important point, especially if you're, especially if you're talking to new patients. Okay. The third point is to learn what you can about products 
and make sure that your patients are aware of the products that are avail available. Um, at the same time I was having another home care nurse come in, they seemed to always be different every time I had them in. Uh, so I, get, I, had to, I had like 15 nurses checking out my rear end after, you know, after my, uh, my rectum was removed, so that was fun. But, you know, some of them, they, they had ostomy patients, but they weren't ostomy nurses themselves. And, you know, some of them kind of said, you know, I have this one gentleman, he's having a really hard time with leaks, he's got a really liquid output, and I just, you know, I don't know really how to help him. And the first thing, first thing that came to mind was, well, have you maybe had him try a gelling product? And I gave her a couple samples. I ended up seeing her again on another visit, and she said, you know what, that really helped him out. Thank you for letting me know that. So there might be a product out there that could help a patient, that you might not be aware of, and, and I mentioned earlier there, there are hundreds of accessories, but there might actually be other ostomy products that are around that you may not even know about, uh, but they might come in handy for some patients. You just have to know where to look and you have to know which patients to maybe make that recommendation. So this, this tip, and I don't blame nurses for this, sometimes I, I kind of fault the um, I had an awesome kit when I uh, was into surgery. It was a really great kit, had all these like different supplies and samples and things like that, but it was a little overwhelming. And I know some people get kits with like every product imaginable being sold by manufacturer. And that might be fine, assuming you know what the products are for and why you might need them. Sometimes new patients don't understand what the products are for or why they might need them. So. You know, I'll hear someone saying, yeah, you know, I, I use the, the skin cleaner and then I put the barrier wipe on there and then I put the powder and then the ring and then the paste and then, and it's like, well, did your nurse say you needed all that? Because it may not be necessary, you know? You know, maybe just a wafer is all you need. Um, and that might set them up to, to more failures, you know? I, I, I seem to believe that, you know, the more you do, the more products you add into the mix, the more complicated things get. There's more opportunity for failure somewhere along the line. So a lot of the times it's like, hey, you know what, just calm down. If you don't need a product, don't use it. And I think that's important to let patients know. You know, they may be getting this amazing kit and super awesome stuff that comes in it, but they may not need all of it. Now they may need some of those products at some point. You know, if leaks come around or if there's a, you know, a change maybe in, in their skin, geography or their body shape, yeah, they may need those products at some point, but not everyone needs it all the time, okay? So sometimes less is, is better. The next tip that I want to suggest is to uh, refer patients to other patients. And I don't mean other patients like a website that's just giving out information. That's valuable, but sometimes patients need to connect with other patients, if not to share their, you know, their experience, but just to have a shoulder sometimes to vent on. Um, sometimes there's a, a sense of camaraderie around ostomates, around people who have certain illnesses, and that really helps to bolster this sense of community. And I think that's really important that patients know that there are other patients out there. Now this might not come in the form of like a group, it might not be online, this might be through like even a patient visitor program. So if that's something that you know is available, let patients know that that's something that is available to them. Um, and the last thing is obviously, you know, understand that there may be a lot of frustration that the patient is going through. There may be some problems that they have that are just very difficult to solve. You know, it's like you have to kind of try everything before you find a solution. So understand that the patient has to go through that, you know, after they leave your office. And it can be very frustrating. Um, and they're not necessarily mad at you if they come in frustrated, you know, that something isn't working out. They're working with you. But just try to understand that frustration and, and please just try to add a little bit of compassion um, to your practice. Okay, now how to support a loved one. Uh, so this is crucial, I think. If you're, if you're living with a loved one, if you're uh, a spouse or a friend or a family member or a neighbor of someone who's going through the surgery, I think there's a lot of things that you can do to help this person along and make things a little easier for them. Uh, the first thing that I would suggest doing is just maybe offer help with errands. You know, you guys get snow down here, but in Canada we get snow and you know, if you're, if you're fresh out of surgery, you really don't want to have to shovel, you know. 
I, I'll find any excuse to get out of shoveling, but I think surgery is a legitimate reason to ask for help. Uh, so, you know, offer help to someone, even if it's maybe to get groceries, maybe if you know that they can't lift something after surgery, help them out. Uh, for a lot of people who've had surgeries, there may be a risk of, of, of hernias for quite some time, you know, maybe over a year and they, just, they might still be at risk. So, you know, help them out in, in whatever way you can. Another thing is to just listen to your loved one. Sometimes they don't tell you things like to get advice. Sometimes they're just talking to you just to get things off their chest. You know, they may not have a support system around them. So just be there and listen to them, listen to what they have to say. And this actually also applies to, um, to nurses as well. You know, listen to what your patient has to say. Sometimes they may not be asking you something directly. They might just be saying, you know, this is the situation without really asking for help or, or, or you know, a solution or anything like that. Um, now the next one, I know some people want to be helpful, but sometimes well-meaning comments may backfire. So you may offer a piece of advice that may sound good to you at the time, but it could be taken as offensive. Uh, and this, I think, applies more to the illness that someone might have before they had their surgery, but it also applies with ostomy uh, in general. So just as an example, if, if someone has an ostomy and they're going to the bathroom a lot, which is normal, you know, especially if they have an ileostomy, you know, don't say, oh, I, I know how it must feel because, you know, I got sick last summer and I was in the bathroom a lot. It's not the same. It's not the same. So, you know, you might be well-meaning you know, well with the comment, but really sometimes it's offensive. It comes off as offensive. It comes off as hurtful or just plain unhelpful. So just understand that sometimes well-meaning comments don't come off as that. Another thing you can do to help uh, support a loved one is to just learn more about ostomies and their care. Now that's not necessarily so that you can be hands-on and help this person out, but just so you understand maybe more about what they're going through, maybe understand some of the challenges they might be facing, um, maybe some limitations, some things that may not be limitations that you just didn't know about. Uh, I think that can go a long way. Uh, just that understanding piece can help you to be a better um, you know, support person for them, but it will also help to make the ostomate more comfortable as well. Now this is something, and I, and I know some of you in here um, are already doing it, but if your loved one agrees to it, join them in meetups, you know, patient groups, patient events, things like that. Being there for support, you know, without necessarily having to do anything, but being there, I think that's a very positive thing. It really gives them reassurance that, you know, they weren't all of a sudden abandoned by their, you know, partner or, or friend. You know, you're still the same person. You're just doing one thing a little differently. That's really it. Another thing that I think is really important, now this is mostly important for um, couples, but it can also apply to friends and whatnot, is not to let the ostomy be the center of your life. Now, obviously, you know, I have a website and that's kind of all I talk about is ostomies. But I have hobbies, I have other likes, I have other things that I do that don't really ever have anything to do with ostomies. So, Sometimes just to get out of that space where you're constantly talking about ostomies or worrying about it or, you know, just get out of that zone for a little while, it, it can really help. Sometimes, you know, we forget that we even have an ostomy. I know I do. A lot of the times I do, actually. And, you know, you don't have to constantly be reminded that you have one. You don't have to let your life revolve around that. Um, there may be some things, obviously, that you might have to plan for if you're going out, if you're taking a trip together. Um, you know, and hopefully that person will know enough to, to plan for themselves, but don't let that be the center of your, your fun time, right? Now, I've put together uh, a bunch of resources. There are so many, you know, to be honest, like hundreds, and, and I could all, all also say a lot of the uh, ostomy bloggers out there, people doing exactly the same thing that I'm doing, you know, speaking to other patients, making videos. I, I always recommend checking out um, those people. You know, a lot of the times it's, it's hard to talk about your ostomy and when you're doing it in such a public way, uh, it, it's like, another, it's like an, another level. And a lot of these people really do share their you know, unfiltered story about having an ostomy. And a lot of them are incredibly inspirational. A lot of them give out very good information, uh, very helpful information. And uh, you know, I, I, do, um, I do recommend that you check them out. Now, I put up Facebook groups 
but I, I should put like an asterisk in you know like fine print terms and conditions there. Facebook groups and really any online community can be helpful, but you have to be aware that some of them are unmoderated. So there might be information in there that not only might be unhelpful, but like damaging, like bad information. So you need to be aware of that. And also be aware of the fact that a lot of people who go on these groups tend to have a problem and they're looking for an answer. Okay, so it may seem negative, and a lot of the times you might have to step back and say, you know, I just, I, I can't deal with everyone else's problems. But understand that that's really what the groups are for. You know, a lot of, and there, you know, there's kind of like a saying that's, you know, a lot of the people who are having problems are going to be online and that's all you're going to see. Everyone else is out having fun. And it's like that for everything. You know, coming from an IBD background, uh, if you go to like an IBD support forum, everyone's having a hard time. Everyone's sick no medications working everybody's just miserable and it's kind of like that's just a small group of people who unfortunately need help and that's where they're going so you're seeing a hundred percent negative but maybe only out of two percent of the actual patient population so you have to be aware of that um, you know there's a resource there to find a stoma nurse if you don't already have one you guys have really great stoma nurses here so <laughs> I don't think that's necessary um, and most of the major manufacturers will have their own like booklets website uh, it may not actually be on their main website they may call it something else but it's kind of put it's, it's kind of uh, put together by them so you know explore those options uh, the UOAA has a really good support group finder you guys have like a local group here but if you're from out of town and you you know want to find something local you can certainly find it there <laughs>